Making research matter. Research dissemination in volatile times. This keynote address has been delivered by Tara Brabazon for graduate women, Manawatu. Taylor and France are selling our research articles to generative AI providers. Outrageous author processing fees. Review it too. Scopus blind spots that exclude so many humanities and social science journals and monographs. So what do we do as scholars to disseminate research with authenticity, rigour, transparency and flair? And how do we do this to a diversity of stakeholders? Together and today, let's work on this project. Let's move words into the world. Dissemination is not simply publishing a co-written article or doing a talk at some conference. It's a plan, a way of organising ideas and knowledge to connect with an audience. We're exploring three variables today and how they overlap. Knowledge, audience and platform. Too often we have knowledge and we think that our work is done. Actually, we're starting in the wrong place. Okay, you have knowledge. But who do you want to reach? And those audiences may be multiple. Let me give you an example. If you are a physiotherapy researcher, you quite rightly want to disseminate in an academic journal, but also a professional journal to reach other physiotherapists. Perhaps you're going to use a podcast to enable citizens to learn about your findings so your knowledge will be cut and transformed for different audiences. And you'll use different language, different modes of citation, different information literacy, different sensory choices, and yes, different platforms. So we have our first diagram, if you like, our dissemination triangle. But I also want to present a second shape for your consideration. And I call this the dissemination quadrant. And in each part of the quadrant is a different word. Synchronous, asynchronous, digital, analog. So we make decisions about dissemination. So, for example, we might want to deliver an actual seminar at a conference. So that is synchronous and in analogue space. Or you may want to deliver a session via podcast that is asynchronous and digital. So remember those quadrants as well. Our project today, therefore, works through three questions. What knowledge do you have? What audiences do you want to reach? And which media platforms and interfaces connect your knowledge to an audience or to audiences? So to make these decisions, my short gig has three parts. Firstly, we explore multimodality. Secondly, curating your research career. And finally, research dissemination strategy. So let's start with multimodality. To understand how we make selections of media, let's talk about probably the most important media concept that exists in our mediated age, multimodality. Let's break the word down to its most basic parts, multi mode <laughs> so multi means many, mode means form or platform or a way or a channel for expressing your ideas, and alite exists in multimodality, but also physicality, corporeality. Alite, of course, links with the French alite and the Latin alitas. It is a suffix. That is the bit that comes after the word. And it describes the condition of being the previous word. So physicality describes the state of being physical. Multimodality describes the state or condition of being multimodal. The word refers to the many platforms and channels that are now the nature of our reality, our way of experiencing information and ideas. It recognises that digital material can move and move quite easily through space, time and diverse platforms. 
Multimodality enables all of us to understand how to operate in a multi platform environment. It enables us to move between platforms with clarity and with consciousness. For us as researchers, multimodality allows us to select which platform is best for a particular component of information for a specific audience. Multimodality in visual communication, for example, places attention on image, language, font, white space, colour, With sonic media, it's the use of melody, harmony, rhythm, silence, talk, language, pitch. With olfactory media, attention goes to what is often a very recognisable or extreme smell, like coffee or baking bread or sour milk. Modality frames how our particular signifying practices within texts determine the limit of the real the true, the normal. That's modality. So think about the modality of a refereed academic article. We see a journal masthead, references, volume numbers, and a refereed article is trusted in a way that a Spotify-hosted podcast is not. But multimodality recognises that there are many realities and truths and normalities, and if we mismatch platform, knowledge and audience, then communication will not work. We need to construct a reality within our text that is recognised by a targeted audience. They're literate in that modality. And if we mismatch platform, audience and knowledge, then our audience won't be able to decode the work. They won't be able to understand it. Multimodality creates an awareness of the multiple realities that are available to be accessed on diverse platforms. So different audiences are literate and comfortable in different platforms. So podcasts, for example, are great for slotting into a busy professional life. That might be for commutes or exercise or dropping the kids off at school. All the gaps in our lives Modality cues are based on the experience of the world and our experience of a particular medium. So if we become experienced in podcasts or in audiobooks, we are more experienced in the modality of sound-based interfaces. There therefore needs to be much more care in understanding the audiences of information. We can't make assumptions about age, gender, race online. Great research exists. So, for example, the average age of LinkedIn users is 44.3 years. On TikTok, the average age of users is about 18 to 24, with more women than men using the platform. Therefore, we have to match the audience we're trying to reach with that information and the particular interface that audience is using. Always ask, what is the most effective platform, what is the most effective effective way to convey this information to a particular audience. The late Gunther Kress was the key theorist of multimodality. He built social semiotics with Robert Hodge. So as researchers, we must not assume that our understandings of information are shared with others. We need the resources and the skills to target communication systems and modes of knowledge to very specific groups. What works for us in universities may not work outside of universities. But what can we do? Well, we're about to start a pretty quiet but careful revolution. (laughs) We're bringing back quality information to our public debates. But This session is also about you, so let's do a quick pit stop to my second section of the day, which is curating your research career. So have a look at the first two pages, that is the first 20 Google returns from your name. How many of those entries are in your control, or is your digital academic self constructed by the opinion and the whim of others? So when an editor, employer, consultant searches for you and your expertise, what are they finding? Now, you've got some choices. You can really complain 
<laughs> about what's been returned or you can create a different digital pathway so that people can find you on your own terms. We curate our digital academic selves and we do that to lift our profile, mm -hmm. but we also do it to lift the profile of our research. I'm using the word curation today with intent. Curation is a way to find, develop, manage and disseminate content. So let's talk a little bit about push and pull media. This is a way to build with literacy that relationship between knowledge, platform and audience, noting that we now live in a narrow casting rather than broadcasting age. Pull media are the interfaces or platforms that we use to, yes I know this is a surprise, pull information to you. So Google, Google Scholar, podcasts, YouTube channels that you subscribe to, Twitter hashtags, Instagram accounts we follow. So you're pulling information, ideas, images to ourselves. Great. Then we have push media. And these are the interfaces that we use to push information to citizens, stakeholders, readers, listeners, or viewers. So again, YouTube, Liberated Syndication, Authors Republic, Academia.edu, blogs. Now, of course, as you've worked out, some interfaces can be both push and pull media. Curation requires that we make these decisions with consciousness for this particular stage of our career. And we look at particular dissemination and research modes that we want to activate that are appropriate to us now. And to do this well, we have to possess multimodal knowledge. The best platform to reach an audience for your research requires consideration and work. I know in these truly dreadful times, it seems like we have no control over our careers at all, no control over our research or our teaching. But let's take these two concepts, curation and multimodality, and let's remember those two research dissemination diagrams, our triangle and our quadrant, to think about today how we disseminate the research in a way that's meaningful. And that's our final stop of the day, research dissemination strategies. And let's start with platinum or diamond open access journals. I know we have all sorts of metrics and rankings of journals. Yawn. Many of these rankings and metrics have been critiqued. Have a look at Retraction Watch, retracting from the best journals in the world. Look at the thousands of dollars that corporate, that is commercial publishers, require to create supposedly open access. Look at how much research these corporate publishers hide behind a credit card. But none of these issues are supposedly considered when we're assembling this metric for our institutions. The exploitation of scholars, libraries, librarians, referees. That's, that doesn't matter. So that major corporate academic publishers make a profit. And now, of course, those commercial publishers are selling our research that we have given to them for free to generative AI businesses. There is another way. For our higher degree students, our early career researchers, indeed I would argue all of us, people need to read our work. They need to read our work to hire us, to cite us, to fund us. Therefore, an important decision for us to make is to choose platinum or diamond open access. Now, there are three types of open access journals. Platinum open access, sometimes called diamond, open access refereed research that is free for authors and readers. Then there is gold open access, and that's a free release of research outputs without delay to an audience. But authors are charged a fee, and it's called an article processing charge. <laughs> then we have green open access, and that's where publishers enforce a delay or an embargo on the research output, and only pre-publication versions can be lodged in institutional repositories. So that basically means the last draft is loaded to a digital repository 
for access. So to clarify the difference, in the old days, conventional non-open access journals, they were publishing to make a profit and they made a profit through subscriptions, site licenses and pay-per-view or pay-per-download. But remember, digitization transformed publishing. Very expensive analog tasks disappeared or in rapidly increased in speed. So this meant that in many ways, distribution costs disappeared with digital articles and books carried online rather than through postage. So why does this open access issue matter so much? Well, open access is a way to address social injustice. In the old days, the posh universities and institutions could pay the posh subscriptions to control the dissemination of knowledge. But of course, academics, all of us, are paid by the public purse. Why should our outputs be restricted? And further, think about it, with corporate publishing models, the taxpayer is paying over and over again for the research. Academics complete our research as part of our publicly funded salary. We complete refereeing duties as part of our publicly funded salaries. Commercial publishers use this free labour to then charge universities a third time to buy back their research that academics have completed and refereed for free. Carla Streb and Julia Blixrod studied this situation and discovered that, quote, commercial publisher revenue reports continue to suggest that scholarly journals are among the most impressively profitable products produced in the free market, end of quote. Open access means that a range of communities can access research beyond the people employed in a university. So we all need open access because if future employers can't read your work, they're not going to hire you. So be really wary of article or author processing charges. This is an attempt to shift the payment from readers of an article to writers of an article. Now, this used to be called vanity publishing when I was a girl, and there is an argument that it encourages publishers to make a profit through publication. Now, I've published over 350 refereed articles and book chapters, almost all of them singly authored, and I started publishing in 1993. Yes, I'm that old. And over 90% of my articles are platinum, open access. I have never paid for publishing. Now, today, right now, today, there are 12,552 Platinum Open Access Journals, listed in the Directory of Open Access Journals. 12,552. So go have a look at the Directory of Open Access Journals, www.doaj.org. Therefore, consider Platinum Open Access as a way to go for particular research and particular audiences. Okay, next strategy. Let's investigate nitros, non-traditional research outputs, and write for journals that enable mixed media presentations. It is important to disseminate widely. Now, we all know that. And students, of course, for decades have been producing blogs and vlogs and podcasts and posters and designs. And all this material is terrific but it now has a name or a couple of names, nitros, non-traditional research outputs, or particularly in North America, RSOR, research, scholarly and artistic works. This material in and of itself is great, and these are research outputs in and of themselves. And remember, this includes all disciplines. So, for example, great science photography. These are research outputs in themselves. So do a bit of research on nitros and add a line to your CV and perhaps in platforms like ResearchGate, Academia.edu and Google Scholar. But if you do want to enfold the nitros into refereed and peer-reviewed articles, so use the artifact exegetical model, if you will, then there are some fantastic journals that are now enabling this mode of publication. 
I'll give you a few titles. Design Studies, Journal for Artistic Research, Journal of Visual Arts Practices, Journal of Design and Science, the Oxford Artistic and Practice-Based Research Platform, and Visible Language. Great stuff. So if you take photographs for your research, if you enact soundscapes, you design and build online or offline objects, you record podcasts or videos, remember you've created a nitro. So put that on your CV and then start to look to these journals that are creating new relationships between an artifact and an exegesis. My next hint is be wary of book chapters. Now, book chapters are a mixed blessing for research students and the rest of us. The problem with book chapters, particularly for PhD students, is that they take a long time to emerge and you really need instant publications to get work. You, as a researcher, you're invisible behind the name of an editor when you produce a book chapter and they also have very low levels of citation. So if you want to get the publication bus moving, then to be frank, book chapters are not the way. Having said that, on Springer and Emerald platforms in particular, just to name two, they have a cannibalization publication model. Now, that that's not as brutal as it sounds, but chapters are cut away from their home book and are available for individual searches and individual purchase. <laughs> and downloads. So book chapters are listed on Google Scholar and Scopus as well. The other great advantage of book chapters is that they are opportunistic publications. So what that means is they're often in a new area and an area you normally wouldn't write on. And you are approached often out of the blue and it's not in your research plan, but it is an opportunity. Occasionally, you can be in a key or an important book that creates a new discipline. Now, I'm 55 years of age. I'm very old. And can I say that's only happened to me once, but it was a fantastic example. So that was in a book called Physical Cultural Studies. I was approached out of the blue, and that became the foundation of a new discipline. But I've also had so much really great work buried in an edited collection and simply lost. So if you can write a book chapter easily and quickly, then hell, go for it. But know that it will be a lagging publication, and it will be a lagging citation metric for you. I think you've got better options. And to give you one really sad example from me, I was approached to write a book chapter on failure. Now, Bloomsbury, Bloomsbury was supposedly the publisher. So I parked all my other work, I wrote it, and it passed through refereeing, and Bloomsbury loved my chapter, but the collection did not proceed at that time. Okay, so then a developmental editor came in for the project, and again, loved my chapter, no comments at all. And two years later, this collection has finally returned to Bloomsbury, and I just received three weeks ago, an email from the editors saying, sorry, there's going to be a delay again. Your chapter's great, but a few of the other chapters need a bit more work. So if you can just be patient with us. So as you can see, this single great bit of research is going to have been invisible for three years. So be wary of book chapters. Next hint, write up conference presentations immediately. This is a rule I give myself. It requires discipline. But if we say yes to a conference presentation or keynote, then we're making a promise to write it up as soon as possible. We've worked hard to create something new and powerful, allow it to flower and find a large audience. So write it up and send it to a journal. My other rule with conferences, by the way, is always force yourself to write something new. Do not repeat yourself and force yourself to be as innovative as possible. Next strategy, podcasts. We forget how recently the iPod and podcasts entered our lives. Robin Mason and Frank Rennie's remarkable book, E-Learning, The Key Concepts, doesn't even have an entry for podcasts. But that book was published in 2006, and that year matters. The year podcasts moved from a Guardian-inspired neologism and into popular culture. Early academic use of iPods continued the decade-long practice of recording lectures 
for students who missed a session. So through the last five years, better uses of sonic media have emerged rather than as a (laughs) medication for poor attendance. Podcasts are an opportunity to connect theory and practice, thinking and doing, and the advantages are clear. Podcasts are inexpensive to produce, they build a community and they add emotion to education. As the Open University has shown through their history, sound-only teaching resources defamiliarise the way in which students and citizens think about ideas. With the eyes at rest, easy visual literacy is not an option. So for difficult intellectual work that is abstract, sonic media platforms are often a great option, slowing audiences down and encouraging alternative modes of thought. Podcasts build relationships and listeners can hear your voice and it builds intimacy and those links. And again, you can provide the story of your research, the context for your research, and loyalty and interest is built around the world. So we can move into sound and sonic media quickly, easily, and at low costs, and we can find international audiences. Next strategy, consider video abstracts. What is a video abstract? Well, the video equivalent, if you will, of a written abstract. It is an emerging genre and has particular characteristics. It's shorter than five minutes. It provides an overview for viewers, prospective readers, to hook into an article or a paper. It's about speed, helping a viewer work out the purpose of the research and the results from your research. It's also a way to lift your citations really quickly. A 2014 study confirmed that while only 5% of publications have a video abstract, it lifts citations by 25 to 30%. So what do we focus on in a video abstract? Well, the rationale for the study, methods, implications of the research, yes. Video abstracts are a new mode of academic communication. They connect the researcher and the research with a viewer. The key is to be clear about what you're going to do in terms of connecting that research to your audience. So is the audience a group of another academics or is it the general public? And remember, if you are writing translational research, then construct different video abstracts for the same piece for different audiences. So video abstracts allow us all to make an article really special and lift it above the thousands of articles that appear every single week. The best video abstracts introduce a written article, but move modes, move media to enlarge the audience. It's a way to attract readers to an article, but to also enliven a multimodal experience. And please keep it simple. Two minutes, three minutes, four minutes, straight to camera, script it, do not speak off the cuff, and work out the structure. So introduce yourself, state the title of the paper, then present the most important bit of information first. What you've discovered, why the audience should care, and why they should read your work. The point of all of this is to lift the citations of your article. And that's where we finish. We remember the politics of citation. You see, this tip is particularly for our colleagues outside of the experimental and applied sciences. You see, what's happened is most universities have signed up to Scopus to provide their metrics and information. And this is a mistake. Citation databases have only a limited selection of publications. And for example, Google Scholar indices are higher than Web of Science or Scopus. Why? Because the scale of the coverage and the speed of the update is higher and greater on Google Scholar. A majority of social science and humanities journals are not included in Scopus. Books are rarely included in Scopus. And the single authored scholarly monograph remains the gold standard for research. And it's only sort of occasionally captured 
by Scopus. Now, I respect all knowledge, from engineering to art and design. I respect all expertise wherever we may find it. But Scopus actively marginalises and erases about half of the disciplines in our universities because it rarely includes books or book chapters. It does include a huge amount of journals, but in particular disciplines. Now, don't believe me on this. Let me quote the research from Information Science. Martin Martin or Dana Malaya, Thewell and Lopez Cazar in 2018 published a comparative analysis of Scopus, Web of Science and Google Scholar. They reported that, quote, the results by broad areas show that Google Scholar was able to find most of the citations to social science articles, 94%, while Web of Science and Scopus found 35 and 43% respectively. Moreover, Google Scholar was able to find 93% of the citations found by Web of Science and 89% of the citations found by Scopus. Last but not least, over 50% of all the citations to social science articles were found only by Google Scholar. End of quote. 50% of all citations to social science articles were found only by Google Scholar. Wow. This study also confirmed that Google Scholar incorporates documents published in languages other than English. So knowing all that we know about Scopus, about Web of Science, about Google Scholar, and all the talk about globalization and international impact, why would we be ignoring Google Scholar? So let me use myself as an example so that you're not alone in this. I've written 20 books. I've written 350 refereed articles and book chapters. And I focus on platinum open access journals and particularly non-North American and British journals. I also have some nitros that pick up citations. Okay, and I've got eight audiobooks. My Google Scholar metric is four times that of Scopus. Now, I know Google Scholar is a bit higher for everyone, so my beloved husband, Jamie Quinton, Professor Jamie Quinton, is an experimental physicist, hard science, and his Google Scholar is just under 10% higher than Scopus. So whenever anyone starts this Scopus nonsense, please feel free to use my example. The books I write are not on Scopus, singly authored monographs, great international publishers, but the people who have written a five <laughs> the people who have written a five hundred word review of these books in a journal that Scopus happens to include, they're present in the database. Look at Google Scholar, find an article with four authors, ten authors, fifty authors. Every citation that that article receives counts as one citation on that person's profile. There could be 50 authors of an article and they all get a citation count. But find a book with one author and every citation is included in that person's profile. Now, are those citations equal? This system means that people who get themselves on plenty of multi-authored papers reap the benefit of other people's work. The entire system of citations is geared for academics to feed off the research of PhD students, postdocs, junior colleagues. Now, yes, thankfully, we've got new research codes of conduct and many journals are asking for the percentage contribution from writers. Now, all of this is welcome. But none of this changes how citations or authorship is measured or indeed was measured in the past. All we can do is behave ethically and work hard and know that all of us, every single one of us have these war wounds where someone did nothing, absolutely nothing, and they added themselves to an article. Now, the academic world has changed, it is changing radically. The lies that are emerging from citation politics and the commercialised ranking of journals are being revealed. So multimodality does matter, and please use this trope to shape every decision that you make. The knowledge you wish to disseminate, your audience that you want to reach, the platform that you will select. Reach out beyond your comfort zone, beyond your lab, beyond your university, and be a scholar of the world for the world. Once we know that 
we matter, we're able to centre ourselves and we make better and clearer decisions because we're proactive rather than reactive. And look, I spent probably 15 years of my 30-year academic career bouncing around the expectations of others. And often these other people were cruel, bullying, aggressive, self-absorbed, and they would crawl over broken bodies to get on in their life and their career. But if we can sit in the quiet knowledge that we matter and know that this mattering is not dependent on anyone else's views, then our professional life does transform. So from today, let's remember that you matter. Your ideas matter. And let's work hard to find audiences for your research.